Today on Engine Power, from a swap meet engine, we begin the build of a stealth 427 big block Chevy. Luckily, yeah. I, I never. Every once in a while, there's a good something, deal. I mean, there. something like this. They, these are these are few and far between, especially if something's not wrong with it. I hope this one works out. No, no, this one's gonna be good. Everything else is good to this point. So why wouldn't this one be good? We're back in your living room again. Welcome to Engine Power. There's nothing quite like seeing a big block fire up on the dyno. This ZZ427 from Chevy Performance is one of thousands produced that makes 480 horsepower. Now we picked this one up used at a swap meet for 3,500 bucks. Now so far it checks out okay, but we're not gonna know until we fire it up. Now they came with a great warranty and awesome performance right out of the box, but that also means conservative steps were taken on the original part selection. Now we want to pull every bit of horsepower we can out of this engine, so some changes need to be made, like the camshaft, bumping up the compression, and changing the airflow characteristics of these heads. Now for that, we're going to show you an easy way to port them at home. Now it's eventually going to find its way between the frame rails of a wicked little S10 project we have planned. For now, we need to see how well we spend our money. We're testing it the same as the Bowtie Boys did with the 770 CFM carb, premium fuel, and with the hat in place, we'll light it off. The critical things to look for on initial fire up is sufficient oil pressure, no external leaks, and obviously no audible warning signs. The timing is simple, 10 degrees of base timing at idle. 26 degrees of centrifugal advance is built into the distributor, and that will give us a total of 36 degrees, exactly what Chevy specifies. Since everything still looks good at operating temperature, we've got the green light to flog this rat. Activate it. All right, let's see what our money bought us here. Here we go. From 3,000 to 6,000 RPM. Woo! Uh -huh. 468, 475. Uh, actually, I'm uh, I'm very happy. Plugs are cleaned off now. Let's back that yeah. up. 469, 483. Smoking, smoking good. Today. There could be bird's nests, dirt daubers. It could be anything inside that thing now. <laughs> you have no idea what's in there. There's only one way to find out, and that's what we're going to do. To the operating room. On the way. This teardown is not going to be a thrash to see how fast we can get it apart. Now this engine made awesome power back on the dyno, which tells us there'll be minimal wear, if any. Now we're gonna inspect several components, take measurements, and even lay everything out in order as it's removed. Plus, we'll show you side-by-side -side comparisons of the parts coming out versus the new parts we're gonna put in it, just so it's easy for you to follow along. The distributor is an HEI, which is a one-wire hookup. Now this thing has a really large cap, but it eliminates the need for an ignition box or external coil. Chevy equips this engine with a dual plane aluminum intake manifold set up for a 4150 flange. Now they also cast a half inch relief here in the manifold's divider, and that allows the carburetor to see signal from all eight cylinders. The valve covers have a tall profile to clear roller valve train and the factory script is proof positive this is our Stealth 427 project. The factory rocker arms look to be in good shape, but we're not taking any chances. Now here's a quick tip. When removing rocker arms, always do them in pairs when there is no spring pressure on them. This will eliminate the chance of stripping or galling any threads on your poly locks or studs. Lunati supplied us with their beefier Voodoo series rocker arms that have a 1-7 ratio and a sinister black anodized finish. This area was designed with extra clearance for higher lift and bigger springs. Plus, the precision sorted trunnion needle bearings withstand higher pressures for better longevity. Back at the rat, the push rods are 3 8 of an inch in diameter and a one piece design. Now there's a slight chance we may be able to reuse them when we put the engine back together. And that's due to it being a hydraulic roller setup. Now because of our new camshaft having such an aggressive profile, that is going to be the deciding factor. At this time, no bird eggs or any evidence of wildlife. But we still have a ways to go. We'll be right back. The investigation continues and how to determine compression ratios. That valley looks really clean. 
Yeah, I, I think so. That's a that's a good indication. Even the cam looks look good from here. Yep, yep, sure does. Back in the shop, the teardown continues. Now, the deeper we get, the more anxious we are to see the final outcome. But we still have a ways to go before that happens. To gain access to several head bolts, the 7 16ths of an inch rocker arm studs need to go, followed by the guide plates. Now, they're on the list for items we're reusing, so on the tray, in order, they go. Since this engine has some runtime on it, there's a simple rule of thumb for taking out the head bolts. It's in the reverse order of how the head was installed. This practice ensures no head warpage, whether the engine is hot or cold. Cracking the egg. Oh, that went off nice. Man, this thing hardly has any runtime on it. Top of the piston's clean. Cross hatch is still good in the cylinder. Looks good. Mm -hmm. Let's see what the other side does. <laughs> it may be cleaner. <laughs> it, it, it looks great. It looks great. What we're hoping to see is a gasket that looks uniform and free of dark spots. If those are present, it's a sign of compression leakage and a major contributor to power loss. To save over 500 bucks when we put it back together, we're going to reuse the tie bar lifters since the engine wasn't ran that much. This is where our first measurement comes into play. We want to know the exact thickness of the gasket because we'll be using that information to help determine our compression ratio, which we'll show you how to do later on. Felpro advertises this one to have a 39 thousandths compressed thickness. Using a micrometer to get an accurate reading, it measures right at 39 thousandths. Using a bridge and dial indicator on the deck, we want to see if the piston is protruding, even, or recessed in the cylinder. This measurement must be taken since it's an important factor in the compression ratio calculation. When the dial reaches its stopping point, the piston is at its highest point, which is true TDC. Now we'll rock the piston in the bore and find the split between those two numbers measured at the edge. This is where the piston flats are level, and this will be the additional data needed for our formula, called deck height. With the piston and rod assembly still on the block, we need to know exactly how much volume the dome of the piston takes up in the cylinder. Now, since we're keeping these pistons in service, finding that effective dome volume will get us one step closer to the equation and let us know what other areas we can adjust to reach our targeted compression ratio of 10 and 3 quarter to 1. Running the piston about halfway down the bore is enough to put some assembly grease in the cylinder. Then run the piston back up to exactly one inch from the deck. The grease's job is to seal the rings so no fluid can bypass them, making sure to remove as much excess as possible so it does not take up fluid volume. Now apply a small ring of grease around the bore to seal it to the clear plate, and pour colored alcohol in using a barrette to precisely measure the amount used. Factoring in that tiny bubble is 197. But we're not done yet. We need more to figure this volume. 0.7854 is a derivative of pi, which shortens the equation. Multiplied by the bore, times the bore again, times 1, which is where we put the piston in the hole, times 16.39, which converts cubic inches to cc's. That equals a volume of 232.51 cc's, minus the measured volume of 197 cc's, gives us the piston's effective dome volume of 35.51 positive cc's. That's one of five volumes needed to figure our compression ratio. Volume of the cylinder, combustion chamber, head gasket, deck height meaning piston in or out of the hole, and the effective dome volume we just figured, 35.51 positive cc's. Since we know the bore and stroke, we'll use that information in the same formula as V5, which gives us 875.64 cc's. We physically measured the combustion chamber at 113 cc's. The Felpro gasket is worth 9.7 cc's. The piston was 27 thousandths in the hole measuring it with the bridge. Using our formula, it comes out at 6.28 cc's. Since our effective dome volume was a positive number, it needs to be subtracted. If it were a dish, it would add volume. Now subtract the cylinder volume. Our compression ratio is 10.37 to 1. Measuring it yourself is the most accurate way to know what you've got. Now, advertised numbers are exactly that. We came up with slightly more compression, but that's okay with us. Now, if all those numbers or math in general intimidate you, Summit Racing has an online compression calculator that's easy to use. Just go to the main site, click on the Expert Advice and News tab, then scroll down to Tools and Calculators. It works. We've used it. We'll see you in a few minutes.
We are back and we've just finished up our compression ratio calculation. Now it's time to get dirty disassembling the rest of the engine. Now to this point, it's impressed us with its condition, especially because of the $3,500 price tag, which is under half the cost of a brand new one. The stock pan is a six quart piece that has no baffling. And this is the last time you'll see it since a new pan is in order for the S10 chassis. Coming off next is the Melling high volume oil pump. We'll reuse it, but give it a little massaging before it goes back on. With access, we can remove the rod and piston assemblies. The rods are a heavy duty forged I-beam design that measure in at 6.535 inches. They're being reused and sufficient for the power and RPM we plan on running. This is the grand finale. Got her. Man, everything looks so good on this motor. The forged aluminum pistons sport a 16th, 16th, 3 16 ring pack that we'll improve on later on. Plus, these things are gonna be good for a little power adder we have planned. Standard size cleavite bearings that are uncoated came in this engine. Now there's minimal wear, which stays true to the little runtime the top end showed. Now when it goes back together, cleavite tri-armor bearings that have a friction reducing coating will give us additional protection on dry startups and the added stresses the engine will see due to its higher output. To go along with the heavy duty rods, a Ford Steel 4340 internally balanced crankshaft is the backbone of this 427. Now it uses a 3.766 inch stroke and out back a one piece rear main seal. Now it's all held in with four bolt mains. Now I'm going to go ahead and get the rest of the short block tore down while Pat shows you some homebrew magic on the cylinder heads and has a little fun on the flow bench. Since we're adding 100 thousandths lift to our cam, a new spring package is on the list. We're keeping the valves in order so they can go back in the same location since the guides are in great condition. They have a 2250 intake and a 1880 exhaust. These heads are advertised to have a 290cc intake runner and over here on the exhaust side they measure 110cc. And remember the combustion chamber measured at 113. We're going to surface the deck to shallow up the combustion chambers so we can help raise our compression. And I'll show you some easy port work that'll increase some airflow, which translates to more horsepower. We mounted the head to the flow bench. Now we'll flow one intake runner to get a baseline at six different lift points, all the way to 700 thousandths. At 200 thousandths, we got 138 CFM. Bumping it up to 300 thousandths, 203 CFM. The next three lift points are right in line with the factory specs. Finally, we'll open the valve to 700 thousandths. Now checking it here is important since our new cam has 626 thousandths of lift, so just flowing it to 600 wouldn't be enough. To do the port work, you'll need some sort of die grinder and a porting kit like this available from Summit Racing. Now it contains all the cartridge rolls, stones, cross buffs, and shanks you'll need to get the job done right. <laughs> And last but not least, a good pair of safety glasses. I'll start by using a stone inside the pocket area, removing casting flash. We're not trying to reshape anything, just giving it a good cleanup. Because in this scenario, bigger won't be better. It's important to let the stone do the work. Use light pressure and keep it moving. Otherwise, it's easy to dig too deep and do more harm than good. Here's a tip, take your time and don't nick the valve seat. That will just complicate things later when a valve job has to be done. Using light pressure allowed me to remove the casting flash, keeping things the same size, and creating a better finish. I'll start blending the rest of the runner up to the factory CNC work. That's an area we don't want to mess with. With about 20 minutes worth of work behind us, the port profile we're looking for is finished. Notice how the casting line is still there? Well, it's much smoother, which is exactly what we wanted. I'm also going to polish the chamber. Doing this reflects more heat, which results in a much more efficient burn. I'm using aluminum wheel polish and a small piece of pig mat to get the mirror finish. Before people started using thermal barrier coatings, this was normal practice in high-end racing engines. Since we now have a completed combustion chamber and port as an example, we'll ship these heads off to the School of Automotive Machinists so they can complete the porting, plus they'll do some things that we can't do here, like a precision multi-angle valve job and milling of the deck surface to reduce our chamber size to 109 cc's. Now I'm going to get these heads boxed up, we'll see you in a few minutes. 
Up next, see how much tension stock oil rings have over low tension ones with a fish scale. We're back and continuing on our stealth 427 big block Chevy build. Now since the heads are headed west, we're going to go ahead and move on. Now every engine has free power locked inside. The good news is you can free some of it up by reducing the parasitic drag. Don't believe us? Well, we're going to show you how much tension a set of standard oil rings has versus a low tension set. First, we'll slide the piston and rod assembly into the bore upside down with the original rings intact. Now we can attach a fish scale to the big end of the rod. Keeping the piston square and pulling it straight up the bore, we can get a reading on the scale. Now the standard rings report 27 pounds, which is the amount of drag the oil ring tension is creating. Swapping out for a set of total seal low tension rings will free up power by reducing parasitic drag. What's it worth? The scale shows 17 pounds. That's a 10 pound reduction at each cylinder. Now anytime you can free up parasitic drag like this, you're not making horsepower, you're just freeing up what's already there. Now we're not done yet. We still have a cool little tip to show you before this thing goes back together and it involves the top of the pistons. That trick involves polishing the pistons just like the combustion chambers. First, we need to tape up the area we don't want polished. Using our three-quarter horsepower buffer and a fine polishing wheel, we can apply white rouge, which will give them a high luster, mirror-like finish. The smoother and finer that finish is, the more it resists heat sink. Plus, it eliminates any potential hot spots, which are a big cause of pre-ignition. Finally, using some more mag polish, another piece of pig mat, and a Scott Blue shop towel, a quick cleanup will expose the mirror-like finish we're looking for. Royal Purple's new Zero W40 API licensed high performance motor oil combines premium base oils with proprietary additive technologies, which creates a blend that maximizes horsepower and meets their 12,000 mile pledge. Now that means you can go 12,000 miles before your next oil change. Compare that to a conventional motor oil and you would have to do it four times. So the Royal Purple not only gives you added protection, but it also saves you money in the long run. So if you're looking for more power, better protection, just go down to your local auto parts store where you can find several Royal Purple products. To say ARP has you covered in the bolt department is an understatement. The world leader in fastener technology makes it easy for you to complete your project with their engine and accessory fastener kits. Now these are available in several different finishes and contain all the nuts, bolts, and washers needed to attach your chosen components correctly. Plus, what that means, no more going to the hardware store to piece together a bag full of stuff, which saves you valuable shop time. Demon has set a new standard for crisp, out-of-the-box performance with their new Street Demon Series carbs. Now innovations are everywhere in this piece that'll bolt directly in place of any stock or aftermarket four barrel. Now the aerospace composite fuel bowl and main body helps eliminate leak pass and keeps fuel up to 20 degrees cooler. Now it's available in a 625 and 750 CFM version from Summit Racing. Now in the next episode, we'll have our massage cylinder heads back from Sam and we'll be assembling our Stealth 420 and strapping it on the dyno. And we can't wait to see the results. We'll see you then.